Bueno, eh, lo lamento, pero tenemos que continuar. El café está muy, muy, muy entretenido y quizás aprendimos más durante el café que el resto de la mañana. Eh, de nuevo, me disculpo por lo tedioso que es esto. ¿no? Como biólogo, eh, siempre me siento a ver una presentación de alguien que me muestra datos de peces y fotos de ríos y me, me mantengo despierto. Y cuando alguien empieza a hablar de temas sociales y tablitas donde se ponen signos más y signos menos, como que entro en coma. Así que entiendo si a algunos de ustedes como que se les cae la cabeza, no tengan ningún problema, no me ofendo. Me siento identificado. Pero algo de esto puede que rescaten y vamos a tratar de cubrir todo antes del almuerzo. Bueno, todo lo, lo importante, tengo que encontrar los aparatos aquí, debe ser este. Entonces, eh, ok, empezamos con las tablas nefastas. Las tablas son necesarias, si no tienen un algoritmo metido en ese software con las eh, páginas de internet y demás, tienen que organizar la información de alguna manera que la puedan manejar en grupo, porque como el proceso que van a hacer es eh, grupal, es colectivo, si no organizan eh, el material de manera sistemática, terminan en conversaciones y reuniones de barrio que parecen del club de fútbol, pero no van a ningún lado. Entonces, eh, yo les doy ejemplos en ese eh, reportecito que les circulé de estas tablas. Son las que discuto aquí y hay una razón, tratamos de minimizarlas. En mi experiencia lo que conservamos es lo mínimo que necesitan como para que todos estén en la misma página, como decimos en inglés. Oh, debería estar hablando en inglés, perdón. No sé, la grabación esta va a ser un mamarracho. Eh, so, we say, everybody has to be on the same page. Because if you're talking about processes, you have people with different backgrounds, with different levels of education, different interests. Some people go there with only one idea. I want more water for irrigation. And everything else is like, They don't even pay attention. When you go through these tables, um, before you make it all the way to the scoring or ranking process, you know that 90% or 80% of the people at least are with you. There will always be some people that don't get it. And don't worry, you cannot do anything about them. So um, you will see that there is a table somewhere there that shows an example like this. This is just an en enlarged version of a very detailed table that you'll have to <coughs> probably build your own. In all, all cases, you have to make your own version that is relevant to your situation. But roughly, this is what I think you should consider including in tables. So for instance, when you have these conversations and you have the watershed assessment, people will talk, well, such and such process is altered by the dam or the tie gate at the mouth of the river or, okay, let's wait a minute. Process, it's a process, indicator. We have a language problem. A lot of the, the failures of these collective conversations has to do with language. No more than that for the most part. So what you need is almost like do a ex exercise in defining terms and at least for the purpose of your workshop. Uh, people may have in their own disciplines what they consider is a process or a sub-process. If they are hydrologists versus biologists, they may not agree. But you say, for the purpose of today's meeting, this is what we're talking about. Just leave your background outside the meeting room and let's all be on the same page. Believe it or not, it's a lot of the work you have to do if you facilitate or someone facilitates a process like this because everybody has their own Wikipedia version of the word. So as we went through this exercise, we decided, okay, people talk about a lot the indicators, what I call the indicators there. So they are concerned about peak flows or the low flows during the summer or the temperature. Actually, those are not processes. Those are the things you measure and you get a sense that things are not right. And, but it's not the process. So is it a sediment delivery type of process, is it a temperature related process, or is it a hydrologic process. So we began lumping all the, um, the indicators first. We started with indicators because that's what people normally bring to the conversation. I say, okay, wait, wait. Is that indicator uh, sedimentary in, na in nature? You see another page here, for instance, sediment movement process. 
So these are la la erosion, landslides, surface erosion, flat plane deposition or um, aggression, which is what Nick showed with the, with the beavers. What category you put them in? And a lot of what people cons concentrate on is water quantity next, tidal exchange, uh, exchange with the underground water, but they well related to water. So we decided, okay, the big, big process here is hydrologic. Everything that is water, we put it in the hydrologic box. And then within that, whether it's quantity or quality, or there is a link to the subsurface flow, we divide that in sub-processes, just for the purpose of our discussion. And then, okay, what are the, the indicators you either been measuring or you could measure after you imp implement certain restoration project that will tell you how that process is going. It's going downhill, it's going up. So then that those are the variables that have been catching people's attention. And then it helped, in our case, to pair in the same table a list. These are lists that you based on the assessment and also people's comments of what are the land activities, the land use, the human activities that relate to that. So if we have a base flow that is very low in the summer and is historically way down compared to what we used to have, what it may be related to in this particular system? Well, in this particular system, it's related to, has been exas exacerbated by the fact that people withdraw water to produce hay, irrigate the fields to produce hay to feed the cows. So there we have a list of activities, some of which could be reverted, some of which could be eliminated, maybe not. But we identify what on earth people are doing in that watershed that are linking directly to the specific indicators that are parts of these processes that are being altered. So you, you build this sequence of connections and in a very um, simplistic way, so everybody can understand it, and everybody has their own pet concern there because there will be people at your meeting that are only interested in this. If you have it there, they shut up and they listen to the rest of the discussion. And when time comes that you argue about this, they raise their hand and they yeah, now the level in the sound. If, if you don't have it in a way that it's transparent and everybody sees their portion or their dog in the fight, uh, it looks like the process is biased you don't have all the information there. The list of complaints is endless. So you end up with these very long tables um, and you have a better example, I think, in the, in the printout. So it goes on and on. You may have five pages. It really doesn't matter. Don't be afraid. As long as you have everything there, you're covered. So again, process a process, the indicators and the activities that surface erosion, well, this being this is being affected or increased in, in, in intensity by a lot of grazing, by the uh, roads that the logging companies built, and by the removal of vegetation for whatever reason. Some of the farmers do it for crop production. The, the logging industry does it for a different reason. But all these three activities are making this variable more and more um, stand out when you're measuring it and you go like, things are getting worse or things are changing. Next table is actually a portion of the same table but built towards your right. So if you see again, these are the variables we talk about, indicators of process, the peak flows, the base flows or the stream temperature, anything that people have been observing and is of concern or interest. Again, the land management activities. What we added here are in our case, the four regions we divide the, the watershed in. So is the, the number one, remember, is the flat plain, the depositional zone. These are the intermediate transport segments of the system, and the headwaters is number four. So then you go, and because you don't need a lot of detail in this exercise, you go like, based on the assessment, and then a lot of... Um, professional judgment, you decide to what level these indicators have been altered according to your assessment. So let's say, for instance, peak flows have been altered 
to a great degree, and whether you consider it great, intermediate, or low is very subjective, but you don't do this by yourself. You have this large table of participants, and again, don't sweat it if things are going in a direction that you think, uh, they're getting it wrong. If you do this long enough, and you repeat the consultation, there is a correction mechanism by having 12, 16, 20 people giving you feedback on a particular cell that you're going to feed with information at some point. So for instance, the agreement here was that the level of alteration of the flow and the peaks that now we observe, it's very high in the floodplain and it's very high in the intermediate transport zone. Uh, what you observe in the headwaters really doesn't, hasn't changed that much. Well, yeah, not surprised because the withdrawal and everything else associated with the land use that has modified the amount of water that runs through down the channel occurs further down. So you don't see, there isn't much of a concern there. So you don't worry too much any longer about that particular element. You, you may bring it into the discussion, but you start highlighting those things that end up in red, and in our case have the H for high. So for instance, uh, let's see if we have something about flooding. Um, Floodplain deposition, uh, well, let's see, I had something about um, infiltration. Well, for instance, landslide. The frequency of landslides and erosion. Uh, the frequency of, and it's related to the road construction, again, logging roads. We are not talking about paved roads that are built to last 150 years. These are roads that are built cheap and expected to last five years. And the forest practices associated with, with the exploitation of those forests have increased the frequency of landslides and their magnitude. We also need to understand when we talk about these different processes that are of concern that in the particular case of coastal Oregon, along with Washington and California, we're in very dynamic systems. Landslides, earthquakes, forest fires, uh, they all happen before we arrive there. The systems evolve with that. The rivers have been blocked by landslides many times. Some subspecies of salmonids have become freshwater residents because they were blocked from their migration route. And they, because they are so plastic, uh, ended up creating populations that were completely landlocked. In some cases, the connection opened again later, and the anadromous form was reestablished. And suddenly, the others, let's say in the case of sockeye salmon, the kokanee version, which is the dwarf little version that remains in freshwater coexist and they don't interbreed. They basically are in a process of speciation that is occurring in front of our eyes. So uh, people will tell you, well, landslides are natural. Well, don't worry about them. Well, yeah, you know, the problem is that there used to be a landslide of a certain magnitude every so often. With our practices, we have 20, 50, 100 times more landslides than we used to. And not only a landslide occurs this year, and the system will heal itself over 50 or 60 years, but we'll have another landslide next year, and next year, and next year, because we are constantly tweaking around and playing with the land. So it's not the nature of the catastrophic events, if you will, that is new to the Pacific Northwest. All of that was there. It's the fact that the, the, the heat, the strength of the heat we give to these guys is harder, and by, before it stands up, we hit it again. So it's the magnitude and the frequency that is actually slowly killing the systems or transforming them into something that we don't even recognize anymore. So, um, and this refers to landslide frequency. That's why we have talked specifically about frequency. They are way more frequent than they used to. Um, but obviously they don't occur in the floodplain. There are no landslides in the floodplain. Uh, instead of leaving it empty, we decided to put a low. Uh, the concern is in the headwaters. So this gives you an idea how you start creating a map of red flags by going systematically through the whole thing. And this, I mean, this is just the top of the list. The list could be, again, four or five pages long. And if you're getting through this process, don't, don't get concerned about the amount of stuff you have. Um, eventually, things will sort themselves out in such a way that you will only end up with the most important stuff in the surface. But you have to go through the process. Okay, um, this is basically, these numbers refer to the regions, one, two, three, four. Only the ones that had a high are reflected here. So we basically dropped the other regions from the list, 
when we are recommended. And this, this could be added, this, if you want, could be another column to the same table. Because you had, imagine here, your, your problem, and this is the recommended solution, your potential action, your tool, your treatment. And then you associate, for instance, if you're going to do um, secondary channels and off-channel features, well, they seem to be lacking in your sections two and three. They don't seem to be of high concern in the other two. I find that unusual because number one normally comes high in that one, but because we had six more watersheds, this may come up. I may have taken this from one particular watershed that is slightly different from the other. So uh, this re reflects reality of the processes we, we went through. Um, if we look at uh, levy removal and levy setback, the levies are these dikes, these berms, and the only in the floodplain and the segment immediately above. So you only see those two regions concerned with this. So that's basically how we keep track of indicator of the problem. Maybe we have there the human activity that causes or may exacerbate, make that problem worse. And then the recommended action. And actually, which regions, which regions are associated with those problems and recommended actions? As if you were looking at a patient with skin problems, well, what members are uh, the arms or the legs or the feet where these uh, skin rashes or, or problems are? You are only going to focus on where they appear. Okay. Okay, we are getting into the nitty gritty of the process. Um, you will need criteria. Criteria are the rules by which you give something a low score or a high score. Uh, it's like when you're um, ranking a movie, you need to make a decision. I give it a five star or a four star, a three star, based on what? Based on being interested and covering a lot of deep, social, interesting information? Or was it funny? Was it well directed? There are a number of things you can look at. Maybe if you only talk about four stars for a movie, you are, that's the general concept for the, all the elements. But if someone wants it to be more specific, you might be able to slice it in two, three, four, five different categories. You may say, well, the story was great, but the, the acting was terrible. So here in this case, the acting or the story, those oops, elements are going to be your criteria. And you'll see which ones we chose in a moment. We have two groups. We started with the biological criteria, uh, mostly because the room was dominated by ecologists and hydrologists. But we realized that if we only decided based on that, we would come up with recommendations such as, let's introduce beavers everywhere. And then not having considered the socioeconomic or political aspect or reality of these watersheds was going to basically stop us on our tracks. We weren't going to be able to get anywhere. It didn't matter how much we told people well, uh, you know, these papers indicate that beavers are good for your watershed. This, we should do this. We needed to rank things based on both, biological criteria and socioeconomic criteria. So we created two filters, two groups. Um, and then you can either work with raw scores or weight scores. And this doesn't mean anything to you yet, but you, you will see in a minute what I mean by that, but there are two options. You can go the simple route, everything is equal, all your criteria are equally important, which I think is not ideal, or certain criteria are more important than others. So you just add a decimal number that you multiply your things for, and things are sorted out based on the weight or the importance of that particular cri criterion. So for instance, let's say restoring ecosystem processes is really important. At least that's what we had decided. So that criterion couldn't be as important as another one that would be, for instance, uh, addressing, the, addressing the needs of one single species, which could be a criterion. But are you going to give them the same weight at the end? So we gave a much greater weight to what we consider a salient dominant criterion or rule. And the other one is included there. It's in that filter, makes up the final reality that you face, but with a much smaller impact. And you'll see that mathematically it's very simple to solve. So we go through the biological filter, and we had six 
criteria. The criteria, we, we chose phrases because they were better, easier to understand. And you will also see, I think there is a table there, and we'll go that in a second. You'll have to define the phrases that define this criteria and how you answer the, qu you, what question you're asking before you're asking people or requesting people to give you a score. So you read this along the lines of, does this action, let's say, placement of woody debris, that's the action. Does this action restore watershed processes? And then you have a table that I'll discuss in a second with option of zero, one, two, three, four. And there is information on that table of what one means versus what two means or what giving it a four means. You need to provide people with that rule so they all have the same rule to measure things or you end up with a very complicated picture. And you, you, you'll see that in a minute. But for now, everything that you pass through that filter, you have to turn that into a question. Does the adding woody debris restore watershed processes? Does adding woody debris restore or improve watershed connectivity? And that connectivity, you also have to dis describe in that table what you are talking about. So in this case, would be increasing the transport of sediments in an at unimpeded fashion from the headwaters to the floodplain and allow for migration and other migration of fish and other organisms freely. So if that is occurring, that you are achieving a higher degree of connectivity that if obviously you have barriers of different sorts. So does you placing debris take care of that or not? Uh, then is it removing limiting factors? A limiting factor in the case of a coho salmon centric analysis would be these wetlands that should be in the floodplain for them to survive in during the winter. Placing woody debris, creating more wetlands in the floodplain, well, not necessarily. So you may get a low score there because it's not actually addressing the limiting factor for coho. It may be addressing some other stuff. Um, oops, does it last long? Is it, and this here is a little bit going back to the concept that Phil Roney has been promoting in publication after publication is look at the, all the techniques that have been recommended in the manuals and papers and rescue only those that have some sort of a proven record of surviving time and ideally producing some positive effects. But at the minimum, do they last? Because we could go with things that in five years or 10 years they're gone. We, we really need to push for actions that have a much longer effect or as, much, as long as possible. And that's again, you give them a ranking and you, you, it doesn't mean that the ones that score one or two in this department are going to be eliminated altogether because they may rank very high in other criteria, so it compensates. So it's a not zero or one situation. You have this, everything is relative and everything, the scale moves one direction or the other depending on how the conversation is coming along. Um, oh, pfft. Does it restore or expands, increases the availability of unique habitats? A little bit the example of the wetlands that I mentioned, but this refers probably, based on what I remember, to, again, uh, endangered species act driven process. You may not have that here, but if you are focused on, cons uh, on a species or two or, or a, a, a guild of species, that are unique and are disappearing, well, does whatever you're doing, placing wood or removing the berms or removing the tie gate, uh, restores or expands the habitat that is unique to that group of species or that particular species. So it's very narrow. You may have your own criteria. By no means I'm giving you the list of criteria you have to choose. This is an example of things you need to insert in any decision-making process that you want to shape along the lines of what we've done. And it's, again, always good to have phrases that then when you read them out loud and the people go one by one before they get, it's a two, no, it's a three, you can turn them easily into a question. The last one is, has, does this technique has a well-proven well effectiveness? It goes along a little bit of the long-lasting effect, but the long-lasting effect has more to do with it's effective, but is it effective for one year or is it effective for 50 years? This one is more focused on, is it effective? Yes or no? There might be things that have an effect for, or an impact,
for 50 years, but it's not effective in terms of producing more fish. It, it's going to damage the river for 50 years. So here is proven effectiveness in creating the, 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 the healthier, the better functioning system that you want. Uh, you may end up with five criteria. You may end up with two. We've done this exercise with students with a huge list of different options. And it's very case specific. In one system, you may find out that you're doing fine with just two and making everybody's life easier. In a larger system, you may realize that you need 20 because of the nature of the group. It's a social construct. So you also have to feel and let go to some extent the control of the process so you keep the people around the table. If your facilitator and the leaders are a little bit dictatorial, a lot of people will start leaving the table and not showing up for the next meeting or the next month meeting. Uh, eventually, you may even accept initially criteria that are redundant. You may go, because our initial list had like 21 biological criteria. And then not only we found it tedious, but we said, isn't number six and number four the same? And be like, yeah, really, if you, yeah, they, they cannot be disentangled. They, they come in the same package if you're look at talking about. So we tried to combine them in that way. And that's how we ended up with this kind of weird collection. And this was a collection that made everybody happy. And that's the most important thing. If there is a crazy group of, from space that wants you to have the criteria of whether the technique can survive a Martian attack, and you think they are cuckoos, but you want them in the process because otherwise they will create problems later on, you add that criteria. That would be my recommendation. If it's so crazy, you will never score high, so you really don't need to worry about it. But they see that their concern was to create bigger cows or, or, or build towers, uh, monuments to, to the local governor. You put it in. Don't fight them because you want them at your table. You don't want them at somebody else's table. Then this is the, and, and there is far less discussion with those because those are biological criteria and mostly the people that speak about them tend to be the professionals that you have at the table. These are the ones that are more funny because they are the social economic criteria that make this filter. And these ones can go all over the map and then phrasing them in a way that uh, uh, captures your preference, your preference or your preference may take more than one day. Um, again, some of them may, be, may sound similar to those in the previous um, page. So the high likelihood of, likelihood of success is a little bit the same as the effectiveness. It's just that you try to look at them through a different lens. You just have the same camera, but you change the filter. When you look at effectiveness in the previous filter, it was exclusively from a biological response standpoint. When you look at this now, you think about the social perception of what a successful project may look like, something that people won't regret or won't accuse you of wasting money in. Uh, it may not produce that many fish. Again, if you go for the papers and what they tell you, maybe you are producing less fish or less habitat per unit of money or effort, but uh, it's something that people like better. People like planting trees on the riparian and they like fencing. And maybe uh, this will score a lot higher in the socioeconomic filter. That might be the case in terms of its biological effectiveness once you analyze them through what the papers are telling you in terms of how much more habitat is produced as a result of that. So it's, it's a slightly different angle. Does it provide educational benefits? Is it something that you can showcase? Is it in a location of easy access? People can see it when they go on the weekend to play soccer because it's in a public park or public land? Is it an intersection of a road? Can you have signs there that tell people we are restoring salmon habitat and now we have twice as many trout because of this project? Thank you, farmer X and so for doing so. Can you take kids from the school to show them what a pool looks like and a riffle and the roll of the wood and how they gravel and can they take measurements and say that the temperature this year is a little bit lower than it was three years ago when teacher Mary took the class there. Because you can also involve citizens in monitoring things. You may not use the data for anything serious, 
but you can keep track both at the community level in the senior center. Um, if you have a senior center, there are groups that people that are in, the, in a senior home in un, in un centro geriatrico may still have a lot of time and energy, and if you involve them with uh, um, habitat restoration or nature-related uh, activity, they will go there every week to measure the temperature or, or whatever you ask them. And some of them were professionals in their previous life, so they get very good data uh, for you or for your uh, watershed council. So this is what this is looking at. Because if it's in the middle of nowhere, you need a helicopter to get there, it's not going to rank very high there, okay? Uh, this one is an important one because we're asking permission to landowners to get to the river. They already have their priorities, their concerns, things they would like to see done differently, their vision of what the valley should look like when they pass it on to their <coughs> grandchildren. If what you're proposing addresses landowner, landowner concerns, you are scoring very high in terms of being able to get there. If you're not addressing landowner concerns, for instance, releasing beavers in, in, in that watershed, uh, this is going to score very low. Actually, you get a zero in our scheme, and we, we selected zero on purpose, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Can you measure the effects? Okay, so it's something that you can easily monitor without spending $5 million with satellites and weird things. Um, now, this one, is it likely to be feasible? Feasible in the sense of, is it going to have social, social political um, opposition? Removal of, if you're in southern Chile or Argentina, you want to remove the invasive salmonids, you are going to find social political opposition. People don't care and they don't know much about the native species that were there before people introduced brown trout, salmon, uh, rainbow, brook trout, and the majority of the folks think that those are native species because they were introduced in 1910, 1905. So those are the situations where are you actually going against the tide? Are you proposing something that you may justify from an ecological theoretical standpoint? But people are going to say, no, same story with the beavers. So that's what you want to really pay attention to. And Funding, you need money for this. So are you proposing to do things that are either so crazy, so experimental, so new that you are ahead of the funding uh, curve? Uh, because we have to go to foundations, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board is the one that distributes lottery funds, the Bonville Power Administration, this hydropower entity that you can request funds from. If you ask them for things that you know they are not funding and they've never funded before or they used to, but now for some reason they decided not to, then you shouldn't give a very high score here because you are shooting yourself in your foot. You are basically going to come up with something that will be a priority, but you'll never be able to get money to implement. So those are the ones that, again, we decided, and this comes from a much longer list, and we trim it to a number of columns that we, dis we thought reflected everyone's uh, concerns and interests and was manageable. Uh, up to six, seven, five is something that you can handle in a meeting, that you can look at, put in a table, and um, if you go past that, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Okay, what, okay. Now the weights, this is basically the same. So what we have here, is the bio, biophysical filter or ecological filter. I think I have a different label in every slide, but it's the biological stuff and the socioeconomic filter. So this one has six criteria, and in English, criteria is plural, and the singular is criterion. So you will see the one with young when I'm talking only about one. And this one has seven. Now this is the, the representation that gives you a sense that they are not all equal, and that's why we try to give them a certain weight in the process. So for instance, restoring watershed processes and increasing connectivity, the Phil Ronnie approach, is so important in our opinion, at least for those who are ecologists, that they should actually overwhelm a lot of the other stuff, and they take care of 50% of the whole pie there in terms of importance. 
while addressing a unique habitat, which may be the habitat that this species needs exclusively and is in a location in one tributary, it's a rare species or whatever, it's important. We put it in the discussion. People want it there, but we all agree that at the end of the day, you should have a weight that is about 10% of this. In many cases, you know that by restoring what normal processes and connectivity, you're taking care of this as well. So you may actually eliminate that altogether, but there are people that want it there or there is legislation that forces you to have it there. So you put it there, but you're not giving it, going to give it the same weight as this because then you may end up with the Frankenstein that really looks very different from the human you wanted to have in the first place. You want to shape it so you're giving importance to those things that are really important. This one is the limiting factors. This is the longe longevity or how long this thing will survive in the stream before it's washed away or disappears. And this is whether it's a proven technique or not. You can change these weights whichever way you want. Uh, and again, try to do that by consensus. Um, when things that are crazy seem to come over and over again because you have some crazy people in the room, put them in. It's easier to satisfy them that way than make, in, make them reason. Uh, eventually, if they think and they learn, because a lot of us learn through this process, for instance, that the unique habitat, the unique habitat is something that comes with people that are concerned about a very attractive species. Uh, could be uh, this owl that lives in uh, old growth forest, or it could be we have another bird, marble murrelet, there's a little um, um, seabird, looks like a football, like the ones they use in rugby, uh, with wings. And pe very pu few people see. Uh, it migrates every day and comes back, migrates 400 kilometers to the middle of the ocean to forage, and comes back at night and uses the, the space near the roots of huge, huge old trees that is all covered with moss. And they land at night as if people were throwing balls into these holes. And you don't see them. You just hear thum, thum, thum. And these are the birds coming back to their nest to feed their chicks. And um, they are listed because we have removed a lot of forest. And actually, they have to go. The forest survived further away from the coast. Initially, they only had to make it fly 400 miles and make it to the coast. Now they have to fly 400 miles and probably go over a range of mountains and make it to the interior valley. So the amount of food they're getting might not be enough for that much of a trip. So we're losing numbers. And again, those who are bird watchers, they may be working as volunteers for the local Audubon Society. Audubon Society is a very strong organization in the United States, all over the United States of bird watchers. They organize a count of birds all over the country, the size of Europe, on Christmas Day. It's known as the Christmas Day bird count. And they've been doing this for over 100 years. And those data, although they are collected by volunteers, because you are dealing with 20 million people collecting data, and you have a huge time series, they actually show how species are changing in terms of numbers every time every year or over time. Now, going back to these, because I can go on these side trips very easily. Again, that person that only came to the meeting because he's concerned about the marble murrelet, he said, I want the unique habitat there. And it should be more important because we need to focus on the old trees that the marble murrelet nests in. Over the whole process of discussion, they will understand that by paying attention to this again, you're actually not leaving the marble murrelet out of the picture you're actually included in the entire ecosystem. So it's a, it takes a lot of patience. It's an educational process. And you have to engage either a team. You may not need or want to have a single person running this. Or if you have a facilitator, it has to be someone that can work with that variety of stakeholders, someone who has been there. If it's someone who's a professional now but comes from a background, that represents the community, maybe from a farming family or a logging family, it's a lot better. Uh, we have experienced that particular Eastern Oregon is a lot more conservative. These big ranches that Nick showed, you don't see any houses and people own 5,000 
hectares. Uh, the landowner is probably way, way um, fixed on its ways, and he's doing things the way his grandfather did it, and his great-grandfather did it. So going with restoration, when they've been removing trees for the past 80 years, it's a lot more difficult to sell. If the guy who's working not only for the Watershed Council, but the one that facilitates the meeting at the local school comes from a farming background and looks like their son or their daughter, in those cases we experience that women have an edge. They can talk to these 80 year old farmers and get them to do things that if I come from the city and I look Hispanic and I have a weird accent, they think that it's a Martian that just landed in front of them and they don't want to have anything to do. So these are kind of very subtle details, but when you go through this a process like this and you select champions to do different roles, uh, pay attention to that social context because you are working in that context. You, you cannot be just blindfolded. Then, go, then you go, it didn't work. And many times it didn't work, not because the process was wrong or it was the wrong time, but you may have had the wrong person or the wrong approach. So keep your eyes as wide open as you can in order to detect and skillfully move uh, in a way that is appropriate to, to get from where you are to where you want to go. You have to be a little bit like a politician. The difference is that you don't take money, and if you take it, you don't put it in your bank account in Switzerland. Um, okay, then, I mentioned the scores. We initially, again, and this is a process that resulted or came out of this trying to make everybody happy. Uh, we, we're going to start with three, three numbers. One, two, three. We thought it was the easiest. And then we asked people to give us the score. And we needed to define what everything meant. So again, everybody has the same ruler. If you just ask people to give you a one, two, or three on something abstract without telling them what one, two, or three means, you're going to end up with a, a Russian salad and you won't have anything to really uh, use in the future. So you make another table as if you didn't have enough tables, you create a new one. <coughs> Forget about the weight now, which means restoring processes. This criterion is 25% in terms of weight, but this is not relevant in this table. You need a statement because it's like voting for some, in, in our case, for these initiatives that the public presents to the rest of the state. The, the, the wording makes a difference with whether people reject or accept emotion. And it's the way, and even in a survey, if you've done surveys of public opinion, you can tweak with it in a way that you get a little bit more of the answer that you want or not. That's if you're aware of it and you're skillful and you have a particular agenda. If you're just clumsy and you don't know what you're doing, you may just be formulating the question wrong and getting an answer that is not really indicative of what people say. So. To avoid misinterpretations, you were, and you put it in writing, it's not just a matter of telling people, this is what, because it just goes after five hours or two days of meetings, people are in a worse shape than you are in now. So imagine what, what, what a lengthy day it gets. So the statement is what they are going to be ranking, and you write it down. So in these cases, this action reestablishes natural watershed processes and maintains functional processes. And of course, before you got here, you need to make sure that you cover in some seminars, discussions, meetings, materials, people who are there, they need to understand what you're talking about. And if you're clear enough, you can even go through this with a farmer, with a logger, with the administrator of the local municipality. It, believe me, it's not impossible. It sounds a little bit overwhelming, but you need to have these definitions and you need to make sure that when they give you a score, if you say, let's uh, remove the dikes from the floodplain. Does this action reestablish natural processes and maintain functional processes? Well, uh, in a quick uh, example of that is if you remove the levees that are separating the active channel from the floodplain, you're actually bringing back the natural processes of deposition in the floodplain, of meandering of the channel. So 
you should have given them this explanation before, but if there is a misunderstanding while you're going through this, you stop and explain it. So then they go, wow, yeah, that's a lot of effect for your money. You just remove the levees and you get a much healthier river all of a sudden. It's like, wow, the moment of the light bulb goes on. So now it's a matter of saying, okay, so you see it has an effect and it has an effect of the type we want. But is it large, is it medium, or is it small? Okay, let's look at the numbers. So, oh, as, forget, don't read that for a second. I, I told you before we started with three numbers, one, two, three. And then we told people, okay, give me your number. And we started finding out that people were starting, well, it's a 1.5. No, it's a 2.5. And we said, can we just say one, two, three? And we spent an entire morning trying to figure out why half the room wanted a 1.5. And they argue, they say, no, because it's neither one nor two is in the middle because sometimes when it rains and you go, like, oh my God, I just want, give me a number. I, let's move on to the next question. So we decided to say, okay, since people, uh, we, we went have coffee break and we came back with a new table that have one, two, three, four, five. So the one that wanted the 1.5 now is a two and the one that wanted the 2.5 now is a four, uh, four. We work with the one to five. Then we found out that there were some uh, criteria that were really, really, really serious if they weren't addressed. For instance, does it address landowner concerns? If it doesn't address the landowner concerns at all, your chances are that they don't want you to go through their fields carrying equipment, disturbing the cows, leaving the fence open. They don't want you there. If you cannot get money because the funding is never going to be obtained for whatever you're proposing, even if you give it a one, you're actually ranking it because the numbers add up. So you may end up by mistake having something that people don't like, nobody is going to give you money for, and the number of things that you go like, why did this end up in this position? So to avoid that, we say, okay, let's move the scale from zero to four. So those that get a zero really don't contribute anything and there's no doubt about it. And when you multiply that zero for, by the weight, 25%, it still gives you a zero. And then we also decided, okay, the zeros are going to be given only a few times and in certain criteria, which were social political acceptance or feasibility, whether people these days and age are going to accept you removing an, a species that they consider of importance, even if it's an invasive species, or things that are, you're not going anywhere, we decide, okay, for those three or four social economic criteria, we didn't apply it to the biological in that way, if something gets a zero, it's a deal killer. Basically, the discussion is over for that. If the landowners are not going to give you access for the purpose of this exercise, let's not even look at that action any longer. It's dead. You may not want to have that, again, it's very context specific. You may not decide to stop looking at a particular action because it gets a zero in probability of funding because you may be rich and you may decide, oh, it doesn't matter, I'm going to pay it from it myself. So that's, that's a different situation. But we chose three that had, were deal killers if we, they didn't get any points whatsoever but a zero. So that eliminated some things out of our final menu of options. So again, now that you know why we have from zero to four, it's not a process that we just went and said zero to four. No, we, we discussed this for half a day before we got, got those numbers. We had to also give people some rule to make their decision on whether they were giving something a two or three or four. So to make it easier, we also wrote it down. So we decided, okay, it does not address any impaired process. None of the processes of floodplain connectivity, periodic flooding, sediment deposit, none of them are addressed by this action, so it gets a zero. If it partially improves at least one process, let's say the meandering of the river, but nothing else because it's still, the levees may have been moved and made wider, so the, the river can meander now, but it still cannot get to the larger floodplain. So for instance, instead of elimination of the berms or dikes altogether, you do what a lot of people are talking about, it's called levy setback. You just move them another 50 or 100 meters. You restore one or maybe two impaired processes, but not the whole 
set of options. So you may give it a one or a two. If significantly restores at least one highly impaired process, like maybe you are in the three um, department, and if it restores three or more, which is a lot, then you give it a four. Now, again, and I cannot emphasize this enough, don't worry too much about the difference between one and two, three and four. At the beginning, you spend hours before you move on to the next action. The first three or four actions will take a lot of time for people to say, it's a two, it's a three, it's a one, it's a 1.5. Uh, it's part of the process. If we have time to even try this this afternoon, you will see. Then two things happen. People learn. We have that ability. And they realize that in the end, it doesn't make too much sense to worry too much about whether you're giving something a three or a four. Also because you are weighting these things with a particular number that modifies everything at the end. And then you have a list of 67 things. So whether your action, your recommended action, ends up on the top or the bottom, is not going to be because you chose a three over a four. <coughs> People will learn that the difference is so subtle, and you're looking at such a complex, large universe, that they, they don't argue anymore between small differences. Also, they get tired. And many of the ones that were more, as we say in English, anal retentive because they don't let anything go. And they want to fight until to death for, it's a two, it's a two, it's a two. By the morning of the second day, they say, oh yeah, whatever. Give it a, just let's move on to the next action. And it looks like it's a sloppy process. It looks like you are losing um, uh, a little bit the, the perspective, but it's not. You're moving forward and covering all the actions through the same lens, because you have the same group of people and the process is moving ahead, there is this learning curve and there's also the ex ex exhaustion curve that allows you to, in the second day you make 90% of your work, while the first day you spend the entire day getting to take care of the first two, three, four, five actions and that's because people still are trying to get a handle on how this works. But you need to give them everything written. Everything has to be clear. You have to be very careful with the language you use. Uh, you will find after you wrote things that are ambiguous and you may change the language accordingly. Pay a lot of attention to that because uh, you are getting asking feedback from your public and you need to make sure that they are all on the same page as much as possible. This is another one, for instance, does it restore connectivity, and it's the same process. You change the statement, which is what they're going to read when they decide to give it a score, and does this action reestablish habitat connectivity? If you just put connectivity, each person in the room will be thinking about the process in a different way. And you may want to give an example. So again, the connectivity is removing barriers to sediment transport in a downstream direction while allowing movement of organisms in an upstream direction, and blah, 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 blah. It, Eventually, after you do it once, you don't need to repeat it again. So, um, then, your, the scoring rubric is what we just discussed. You need to have it. You need the definitions and the descriptions. Uh, if you are using data from books, reports, studies, your watershed assessment, you need to be clear where that came from. Your process will derail if you are a little bit obscure or uh, manipulative with your information because you have all these different interest groups around the table and some of them are suspecting you. They think that you have an agenda. So you need to make sure that if there is information that is being used to rank something higher or lower, it's in this publication. And if they don't like it, they can, they can come back. They're welcome to come back with a better publication that meets the standards of science and shows a different result. It might be good for everybody to know that. Um, then we use that scoring chart from zero to four. You may, you may work here with the one to three. I, I don't know, but I suspect you, it will be very interesting. I suspect you'll run into the same situation. People that want to split things very, very narrowly. Then you have to go through the process of 
deciding on the weights, whether something is 25% versus 5%. In general, again, 5, 15, 20%, it doesn't matter. Uh, when you, it matters when you are in the something weighting 40%, 50%. That has to be something that everybody agrees is important or you're going to have a problem. What ends up happening is that you create a picture like this, oh, yeah, gosh, uh, where you, if you have socioeconomic criteria here and biophysical criteria <laughs> here, uh, these numbers too are low because we're looking at weight scores. If we just added them, two and three and four and one, and we'll end up with numbers such as 17, 19, 26. But then when we multiply them by 0 0.25, which is equivalent to a 25%, of course, all your weights for that filter have to add to 1 or 100%. You cannot have 120% or 200%. So you multiply them by those decimal numbers, your weight score or modified score at the end is much smaller. So you end up with numbers that are 1.75 to 3.5. In reality, it doesn't matter the size of the number, obviously. What it matters is that it's being modified by the weight. So things are shuffled, shuffled a little bit because we give education, unfortunately, I feel bad saying this, less importance in this case than restoring watershed processes. In the end, we are restoring watersheds. We are not necessarily running an educational program. So you follow me on that. So. Um, these numbers, when you scale them down the way we did, at least, we end up with numbers that go from zero to four, I believe. Screening them, we did some graphs to decide, and I, I, I recommend you do some graphs on how these scores go. You, you decide to cut the cake in certain places, and there are some natural spots. There are some plateaus that you decide, okay, all this is the same, and then while you're below this number, look, they start going down. So we decided that two was a good cutting point to make the difference between things that were really, really, really good and things that could be good, but uh, we had to argue about that. And then things that were below that in both departments were not really that good. So if it's equal in our, in our case to a number two or greater than two in the socioeconomic department and in the biophysical department, we consider that a green uh, project. Because in the end, again, we didn't want to argue whether something that got 2.5 should be given priority over something that got 1.75. And what do we do with the one that got 1.65? So we decided that there will be chunks. This is not, once you finish with all this mathematical exercise, it's not like a ruler that you can tell that 1.85 is higher than 1.82. It's not. This is basically cutting the, the top of this cheese that has a lot of the cream and putting it there where you're going to, what you're going to be working with next and maybe the water, the, the, the whey, the suero that is in the bottom, you separate it and you use it for something else or you discard it. It's more or less that process. Uh, as you're going through it, it doesn't look like that's what you're going to end up with, but the reality is that you cannot differentiate that finally through any process that we have analyzed. So it's the good, the okay, and the ugly, which we are going for. But you get there in a very rational and methodical way that everybody understands. So the green is projects that within that group, you can choose any. Then you can become opportunistic. You say, wow, look, we have these six different actions, and we could implement this one this summer in Maria's property because she's already thinking about planting so then you, you decide that based on that. Oh, we got money for fencing. The county has this special, and these things happen from time to time, and if you pay half the price or you buy the wire, they give you the post and the labor. And you go, let's do that because we could do it before next winter. Then you become opportunistic, but you're opportunistic about things that you know make sense and they are a priority. Then if they score highly, in the biophysical, again, we always give priority to the biophysical, but your social filter is the breaks. So if the biophysical is greater than two or, or equal, we put it here as well on the upper layer, but if the socioeconomic is less than two, it's not a green light, it's a yellow light. 
which to us means clearly you can cross the intersection, but you have to look both ways. And you may need to stop. Basically, these are projects that have a lot of biophysical potential, but the public or the funding agencies or some other entity is not prepared to really give you full support right now. So what we recommend in those cases in our context is to put a lot of time and effort for the next four, five, six years in educating the public. You need to work with the public. You need to bring extension folks. You need to invite speakers. You need to organize seminars in the local club. In five years, when people think differently, then that will be a green project. But if you do it now, you'll actually make things worse because it's not going to work, and then people will tell you, I told you so. Why are you wasting money for the taxpayers? This should go to the hospital for the... So you don't want to make mistakes right at the beginning when everybody's watching what you're doing, uh, when it's obvious that people are not prepared. And again, a very simple example, perhaps it's an exa exaggeration, but it's a good example, is releasing beavers. Releasing beavers would create so much fish habitat there that it's a no-brainer. As a biologist, you don't need to really think twice about it. But people don't want it. So that will get either a red or, at a minimum, a yellow. And there are watersheds where you may get a yellow because there are very few landowners. Maybe they're all hippies and they don't care and they, are, they make a living as dentists or lawyers in town and they want their property to look like it did 100 years ago. So then maybe you can release beavers there. But no way you can do it without any discussion, without any information, and without making sure that everybody's on board. So those are the yellow projects. Then you get a number of projects that score highly with the community, maybe a par park. But if you're restoring fish habitat, having a park with a bench and, and a playground for kids, really, um, my group, let's say, is the Watershed Council is about getting money to restore the river, and I'm not about to build infrastructure for people to walk their dogs and, and <coughs> spend the afternoon playing chess. What am I going to do? Well, if, if the group, and depends, again, it's context, context, context specific. If your group is about making friends with the neighbors, if it's being in good terms with them, so you, want, you can go to the ranch in two years to remove all the invasive plants and put native plants, you may actually want to be in the room with them working on that. So we call them blue, ice blue or cool. These are cool. They're kind of nice. You don't want to spend a lot of time and money because you have a limited budget, 10% or 15% is your overhead. You're not going to send the two kids that work for you and are at the university spending every single weekend meeting with these people that want to have a chessboard in the park by the creek. But you may have more human capacity or human capital to write a proposal, to put something nice, to, com to convince the city that this would be useful, while the old neighbors that want the chessboard are never going to get there because they don't know how to do it. So depending on the case, you may just want to put a little bit of effort, at a minimum, participating in the discussion, so you're, you're considered to be a member of the, the community. And if you can help in any way by spending a weekend painting the, the, the sidewalk or, or putting the, the swings for the kids in the park, uh, I can guarantee you that at least in our part of the world, that makes a huge difference. Because then at the next meeting, you can go and talk about fish and fish and fish and fish all you want, and they listen to you. While if you only get together when you're in, it's about your stuff, and other things that may be of interest to the community, you go, oh, I don't have time for that. In small communities, is the end of the conversation. If you're working in a city like Portland and you're addressing the urban folks, the urban people, it's a different story. And I'm sure that you can gauge that, you can decide that here very easily. Finally, the red ones, as you can imagine, are bad in both s filters or in the socioeconomic. They may be good in this one, actually. But if they got a zero in three of those criteria that I will mention in a second that are deadly, we decided to put them in the red zone. Don't go there. Uh, you are going to get into trouble. And 
People say, well, there are certain things that we need to do. Well, there's so much that we need to do. And the list of things that we can potentially do easily or with a little bit of effort is more than we can afford in terms of funding and manpower and time. Why focus on the impossible? It doesn't make any sense. It's not try. Give it a try. You won't go anywhere. You won't get anywhere with that. So, um, okay, sorry about this. This is a the terrible slide. When my students put a slide like this, I said, you cannot give a PowerPoint presentation with something like that. But again, you don't need to look at it. It's for the effect, and you have that table. It gives you an idea of what you end up working with, and you don't look at the individual numbers. What you have is, and you create this obviously in an Excel spreadsheet very easily, you have your two filters, the biologic with the six criteria, and the socioeconomic with the seven criteria, or whatever number you have. The weights go here, it's actually presented as a percentage, but in reality we, we put a decimal place, so this would be 0 0.25, 0 0.20, 0 0.05, because when you multiply this number, which is the sum of all these, 3, 3, 2, 2, 2, 3, you end up with a 15, you multiply it by uh, the addition of the, actually you multiply each one of them, and then you end up with a weight score that instead of 15 and 19 is 2.6 and 2.9. Um, why is not the emphasis on having a small number? I'm not concerned about working with 2.6 is better than 15. The 2.6 reflects this important criteria and the 15 doesn't. The 15 considers that unique habitat or proven technique is as important as restoring ecosystem processes. And we decided that they were not. And that's why we have to do this little mathematical game to end up with a number that reflects how important these two criteria are over these other four. <laughs> so look at this. This is all in the flat plane. So we have a table like this just for the flat plane, another one for the uh, intermediate trans transport zone, another one for the headwaters all the numbers, you end up with these weight scores, uh, and then, uh, we'll go back to that table in a second, but I think it's redundant because I already explained that. Again, same table, a little bit smaller so you cannot see it. Um, you have the project type, the bio criteria, the socioeconomic criteria, the weight scores, and then we give them those colors based on what I explained before. So here you have, and you have that in your uh, document. So uh, this is basically the description. Now these numbers, again, it's not a magic number. You won't end up working with a two or a three. You again need to do a little graph and decide where it would be appropriate to slice things because you will probably end up with very different numbers than we did. Uh, but you need that partition or you will be overwhelmed and you will also end up considering things that are still iffy or not very clear in the social agenda, as important as those that are more acceptable. And I would recommend not to implement things that are not socially acceptable first, because you need to build a reputation, you need to build some connections, build bridges, as we say. Start with what is scoring high in both departments only. Otherwise, um, you will last only two or three years before people uh, start talking bad about what you do. The local newspaper is always a good place for them to start. Um, and then, remember the zeros, the deal killers. We decided that these two social criteria, I thought we had three, but I'm not sure why I'm missing one. But um, no, I guess that's not it. Um, there are three, actually there are four in that case. Forget about these circles, I think they've been displaced from the other. The ones that have an asterisk, likelihood of success, addressing landowner concerns, implementation feasibility, and whether it can be funded or not, they have an asterisk, and it means that if they get a zero, for instance this one, addressing landowner concerns has a zero, and this is target removal, 
removing those doors that keep the tide from keep keeping the river back and inundating the fields is something that nobody wanted. And no concern of the landowners was ever associated with removing that. As fish biologists, we wanted those tide gates gone. I've been working on tide gates for the last six years and be checking how fish using pit tags and antennas, how the fish make it. And I can tell you that the best solution would be to remove them. But no landowner is, in landowner is interested about them. They actually don't do that much good, but people think they're good because engineers put them there 80 years ago. We don't want that removed. We're afraid that, and more are coming because of sea level rise with climate change. We can see that there will be more tie gates and more tie gates in the future being installed by the communities. Uh, what we can come up as a solution is better designs. Tie gates that are open for longer periods of time and they don't create turbulence and the fish can pass But that aside, uh, what I was going with these stories that if we got a zero there, this ends up being r red. Uh, on my screen it's red, there is kind of orangey, and I, don't ask me why. Um, there is a problem with the projector, I guess. Um, so, I, I, are you following me? Because uh, it's, it's very tedious, but uh, my, the important thing here is that you get the idea of how this is all put together. You can create your own s system. Just pay attention to the different elements. You can pass on to somebody else. As a biologist, it's not very interesting to do this stuff. But you can try to find the group or the people or the students in social sciences that you might be able to cooperate with and try to explain certain things that you think and maybe very different in many ways from this, but that you have identified as key elements in a process like this, so you get everybody involved. Okay, this is the same deal. Uh, it shows you, for instance, that signs that says what river it is and that it has salmon or that this was built by the Coos Watershed Association, if you're restoring habitat, it's not really something that you're going to put your money on. But people liked it. And this is, these are not educational signs, by the way. These are more like landmarks. So it came out as a blue project. If people want it, and you can help design the signs, put the little fish, the name of the creek, uh, and creates good rapport with the neighbors, do it. But it's blue because uh, don't use your own money and a lot of your human power on that project because it's not going to create more fish habitat. Uh, channel reconfiguration, which basically is turning that straight channel into a meandering system. Uh, Nick might be able to do it because he's in the middle of nowhere and the landowner has two million acres and his house is five miles from the creek. But uh, where we are, where the properties are four or five acres or ten acres, and the barn with the cows is right next to the creek, you cannot tell them, oh, we are going to create a meandering system here. At most, they might be able to move the levees or the dikes 100 meters away from the creek. You can get certain things done. I'm not sure if we have levee. Um, well, in levee setbacks, we have it in, in some other place. And it came as something that we could do with a lot of education. I'm not sure why the large wood placement here came red. Um, don't quote me. And, and there might be a reason, but it doesn't make sense to me in that case. Um, this one, again, people didn't want in the middle of the, the river, the, the transitional zone, uh, off-channel features. There isn't a lot of room, actually, because the, the valley is very narrow, and people didn't want infrastructure, houses, paddocks for horses. A lot of people have horses for hobby. Um, they don't have cows anymore. They don't have a dairy farm, but they have horses, which are pretty bad for the creek. I love horses, but they turn the creek into crap. And um, they didn't want any of that, and they didn't want water conservation measures at this at this point. Maybe if you do this 20 years from now, things might look quite different. Um, and we are about to finish. Now, you think, where is all the public participation in this process? Well, you've got 12 people or 18 people at the table. That's not a lot of community folks. The reality is that... Um, what we did, and remember, these are six watersheds in our case. And we, uh, so we had this process 
done six times. We did it in the house of someone who's kind of a leader in the community, respected. Normally, people who have a house that everybody wants to see from the inside, it's kind of we weird, but uh, we noticed that a lot of folks uh, could be a physician, a dentist, a lawyer, that th the farm they inherited from the family, and now that they have money, they build the house up high and it has a lot of glass. And uh, if you tell people, well, we're going to have a barbecue, we did salmon, uh, we have to provide them with food. And um, so we were going to have a salmon barbecue at that house. A lot of people go and we ended up finding out that a lot of people went because they wanted to visit this guy's house. Also again, at the house of someone, they're polite. If they don't like what they hear, they were going to express it in a different way that they would if they are in the public arena. If they are at the local library or a local school, not only you get people that don't own property there and they just want to complain about government and about Obama, about the fact that he's a leftist Muslim that was brought from another planet, and you go like, oh my God, we just lost the meeting. There's nothing we can do here because there's a lot of three people that are crazy and instead of being in a mental asylum, they came to my meeting. But if you do it in a private house, uh, that doesn't happen. First, you do it by invitation. Uh, it wasn't open in the newspaper to everybody. You send invitations. The, the group got the address and names from the municipality. They have a list. So they receive this invitation to a barbecue, a salmon, and at the house of so-and-so, and uh, you make it in a day that is easy for people to, to, to attend. And uh, out of those folks, only 20% or 30%, if you're lucky, 17% was our median, will show up. And some of them only come to see what the heck is the whole thing about. They want to make sure that the watershed council that they heard were a little bit like Greenpeace, are not going to force them to kill their cows and put trees all over the place or things of that sort. And what we have heard is that once they attend the meeting, the, the council, this group, the, the whatever organization you, you work with will have to introduce themselves to these members of the public and the things they do and who they work with. And a lot of people say, you know, I'm not interested in the process, but now that I know what you do, I don't have a problem you coming to my property. Just this is my name and phone number, and let me know my son. Normally, these are old folks that have that attitude. Talk to Jimmy. He will let you in. I don't have a problem with you anymore. Before that meeting, and also because it's happening in that social context where you are at the house of this person that they think is a little bit like them, either from the same political view or uh, you don't go to a crazy place so people get scared and they think that there is an agenda. Um, so uh, that's the way we set it up. And what happened? Did, did, it went to, did it go to sleep? Maybe like all the audience, everybody went to sleep, the computer too. So um, what I was going with this, oh, is the, the end of the, the, this presentation, at least for now, is we went back to the larger, larger audience. When we did the, the whole scoring process, we didn't have 25 people every time. We had about 12 or 18. Most of them were professionals from the agencies, biologists. But we had from each, in this one of these watersheds, we asked three or four people to volunteer to participate. We said, you know, we are, you are very busy. You have to value their time. And you try to make things simple for them to attend and say, are there two, three, four people here that would like to participate in these meetings? Raise your hand. We're going to, to invite you so you represent the larger community. So we did that. In some cases, we got people that went through all the meetings. Other cases, they came to one or two and then they disappeared. You cannot force them. You cannot go with a gun and say, you have to come to the meeting. And then once you have your results for some specific La batería. Sí. ¿No está enchufada? No. Ah, ¿la podemos enchufar? Sí. Ah. No es mía. Es de Nick. Y Nick, Nick desapareció. Um, 
Ok, me parece que tenemos un problema, pero el tema es, oh, sorry, the, um, the, the final validation with the public. This is what the last three or four slides are about. So you, you involve these three or four volunteers. They have some input in the process. Then you have all the experts also informing the process. And for the biological filter, you don't need to go and ask the community what they think because truly is not relevant. They are not going to tell you what a watershed process or, but for the, bio, for the socioeconomic one, landowner concerns, social political acceptance or feasibility, funding, they, they have an opinion and you want to know that. So we specifically have a survey. These coffee clutches, I mentioned that in a second, but we have a survey to the larger group of 25 or 30 or 40 landowners that at two of those coffee clutches, we give them this survey for those specific criteria. Is this something that addresses your concern? Are you worried if your neighbor upstream does this? Would you like it or you would kill your neighbor? Or do you think this money would be well spent on this or you would have a problem with the, the government giving money for this type of activity? So you, you focus on those two or three, make it simple. Give them also a simple scoring system. And I was going to show that to our surprise, their response and what we got within our smaller circle were very, very close. They track each other. They have bar graphs showing our score, their score, our score, their score for those criteria. And the difference is not significant. Um, basically, those things that we consider that in our group, ah, this, the landowners are not going to like this, I can tell you. When we asked them, no, they didn't like it. When they thought that something was, uh, they, they didn't want it in their property and they didn't want it in the neighbor's property either, we also got that right. So it was uh, calibration that you, we needed to do because we really didn't know exactly how the community th thought. We had tried more involvement. We wanted more of them to participate in the whole process. Forget it. They don't have the time. But you have to acknowledge that. You have to t let them know that they, they are invited to every meeting. But you also know that they are busy people managing a farm or having a, a, an accounting practice in town. And so you want them, at least when you need them, to, to be present. And we did three coffee clutches, one at the beginning when the Watershed Council says this is who we are, and, uh, and then talk a little bit about the assessment and the results. We show, well, there is oxygen problems here, temperature problems here. You show the maps, you educate them a little bit. You're not going to achieve a lot in an hour. You cannot take more than an hour for that presentation. Then you, they want to eat, and, um, like you. And then uh, the second coffee clutch is normally, to make it different and more interesting, you, you normally start in the house and then you take them on a tour. So it's like, remember we talk about tree planting or we talk about uh, uh, fencing? Let's go. You have a bus or something, depending on how many people, and you take them to the places where you have already been doing this. So in some cases, they go like, oh, this is what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, no problem. You can do that in my property. Because if you tell them that you don't want the cows in the creek, they really get scared. But if you show them that actually the, the cows will have access to the water, and in some cases, depending on where you are, you can provide water uh, with an automatic system on a trough that is away from the creek. And in other places, if, uh, with a solar system, I mean, the things that can be done are crazy, but in some other cases you just give cows access to the creek with a fence that limits them to be one cow at a time. So they go drink and they get out. The other one pushes the other one. But you don't let them just sit down in the creek and they behave like uh, buffaloes that hang around the riparian and the creek all day when it's hot. So the, the, the projects may differ from no access whatsoever to limited access to and when the f you show them the examples, they go like, oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. And we had people from ag extension, agronomy extensionists, who show them that, for instance, if they have sheep, sheep are mo these days more common than cows there because these properties are small. And they show them that if they rotate the sheep, so they didn't spend more than X number of weeks in each field, 
by the end of the summer, let's say, the sheep were healthier and heavier than if they just left them go wherever they wanted. And showing them that, people thought, ah, and you could do it with electric fences that you can move around very easily. And these guys showed them how they could move the 200 sheep every six weeks. So by the end, the field looked very different than it did if you just left the sheep there all summer and went back at the end where they had eaten everything along the river. So things like that were associated with the second coffee clutch. It's more like a tour, education, demonstration. And they also see that there are neighbors that already allow them to do things and they still haven't lost their lives and their properties. There is this paranoia that if if you let the government or anyone from outside do something in your property, you may lose it. Next time they want the entire property. And they're crazy people, believe me. In the US, there are lots of crazy people. But uh, there, is, there are a number that seem crazy and when you interact with them, oh no, it kind of makes sense. There is ignorance a lot. Now, now and then you get a veteran from whatever war that lost half the brain and is going to receive you with uh, big weapon and you go, sorry, sorry, got wrong address. But it's not the common denominator. It's more common actually where Nick works because they tend to go away from the society. So there are certain ranches that I wouldn't even go. They're training, they do paramilitary exercises, preparing for the, when the, the world ends and there's no more government, they need to be trained. They're called survivalists. Anyhow, let's not go there. Um, so uh, the third coffee clutch, and uh, this is truly the end. I'm not sure what time it is, but is it, is it a quarter to two? Okay, we, we may end up finishing earlier because the, the computer died. <laughs> who has the, the who unplug it? Um, so the third coffee clutch is when we do the survey. So you already know the, 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 the sites, you already visited this stuff. In some cases, we did a few things during the summer. And uh, now we, we did this prioritization process. This is what we're going to be doing the next five years. Tell us if it's something that it addresses your concerns. Tell us if it's something that you don't want next door or you, you'll take your neighbor to court. Tell us if you think that social politically in the community because you are a member of the Rotary Club or you are, people are connected in different ways. So tell us if you think that this is not going to be feasible. Give it a score. And again, we collect that information and that's when we compare it with our own parallel process. And we were lucky. We thought, wow, yeah, this, this works. We, we got it quite close. So I think we leave it there for now. We have a little bit about how you engage people. Or I could talk about, because I have a bunch of presentations and um, I eliminated one based on Nick's talk this morning. I thought, you don't want to hear any more about the same stuff. And now, and I'll address your question in a second. I either can talk about, um, it's, it's more of John's chapter on how to work with landowners and the different types. Early uh, um, converted people that immediately want to try something new. Uh, the ones that are the early majority that follows, the ones that are behind and you really need to work a lot with them. Those that are never going to help. I mean, those type of things, we have a um, uh, presentation that deals with techniques, how to approach them, things of that sort. It, so it's basically really working with landowners. But I don't know if you want that. The other way, uh, uh, other presentation I was planning to, to give, but again, we don't, I don't think we have enough time for both. It's more, mostly about monitoring, backy design, uh, when you don't, do tr you don't have data before how you replace that with spatial comparisons, uh, how many samples you need in order to tell the difference, how you need a power test. Basically, is how to design an experiment and, and have a statistical design that is sound. And I don't know if you need that, you want that. You want to see how you extrapolate that from your lab to a restoration project. Uh, all that is part of my circle spiel. So let me know where you would prefer to go next because I don't want you to fall asleep, at least snore too loudly after lunch. Okay, think about it for a minute. You had a question.
Totalmente de acuerdo. It's a human thing. It occurs, it, we, we are just like that. Yeah, the question, I'm not sure if this is relevant to repeat it in English, who knows, I don't know who's watching from out there, <laughs> is whether we, uh, how long that did the process take, whether we had follow up uh, in terms of providing information to people regarding the results of the work over the long term, and how this has grown, and how we, how we have kept people informed. And uh, this is, that's not my work at all. I mean, it's being very well done by John's group because they are in the community. I'm in a different town in the university and I'm dealing with other stuff. But this started in 2006 and finished in 2008. So originally the whole design of the experience took two years with the funding that I mentioned earlier. And um, so in two years we had these six small watersheds prioritized and some of the projects already started on the first summer afterwards but I mean this takes much longer time than the two years. Uh, so now we are uh, 2015 if seven years later. Uh, the approach was taken from there to much larger systems or other systems of the same size. So basically that was the pilot test. It was polished there are some things that had to be changed in different areas, and they learn by trial and error. Uh, but what I gave you is basically the, the main foundation and the centra central piece. Uh, John could talk for five days about all the different things he had to consider or do depending on where he was. But this was applied within the the Coos Watershed Association is involved not only with that large river that you saw that looks like the head of an animal and these little six watersheds, but also has under its jurisdiction like 10 other small watersheds that drain directly into the ocean that nobody else, they are not part of a large watershed, so they are orphaned. So they take a much larger chunk of the coast than would be the case if they were in the an interior watershed council. So then they went and applied these to all these additional watersheds. And then they worked with the watershed council immediately south, and they did the same thing. So basically, this approach has been applied in the last six, seven years to about 50% of the coast of Oregon. And people are creating their own versions. Now, I think part of your question was, well, do we go back to the neighbors? Yes, because the restoration processes, the restoration actions don't go away. Y they get the money. The implementation happens two years later because you write the proposal now. It's going to be reviewed in December, let's say. This is not fantasy. In May, you, you send your documents. The board or the Bonville Power Administration or even their foundations like the Ford Family Foundation or the Fred Meyer, which is a supermarket, has a foundation. I mean, it's the states. There are all sorts of money from places that you need to know where to go. It's actually a profession. There are people that spend all their time trying to tell you where you can get money from. So, but normally the cycles are about eight months at a minimum. You, so you write your, finish your document now, send it in the mail, or by now it's all electronic, and you forget about it. You don't know what's going to happen. By November, December, you, September, you may hear that you got the money or you didn't get the money. If you got the money, you won't see it until the following spring. You got the money, but it's just the approval. And so if it's a coherent group, they may give you the money in a way that matches the seasons so you can start your summer work. Other groups don't pay any attention to that and they give you the money whenever they want. So they may give you the money in the middle of the winter and you can do social stuff, but you cannot send anybody to the river because you will lose them. Um, so by the time the, the prioritization is done, you already spend a good couple of years by the time you can write the proposal asking for money, you're on the end of your second year. By the third year, you get the money and you start your work. And you're constantly seeing the neighbors that allow you to have access. You have a once a year at the minimum, at the minimum, a once a year open house is called. So that you do it in the, well, they do it in their office. They have a room this size. And they have activities. They, they, they cover different topics to attract people. And uh, so those who want to be engaged can be engaged. And then the last thing they do, which is good, 
They also send a newsletter uh, with, um, there is um, some tax, local tax that is mailed to everybody. So they have asked the local county, this is not city because the city wouldn't reach the farm, so it's the, the county, uh, to include in the envelope for free, since they have to send the bill for taxes, uh, to include in the envelope a newsletter that tells them about the projects and how things, so people may never participate, but they receive this, and those who want to read, they are informed about what's going on, and they, they may see a map also with where the projects are. There are many different ways. Now they are trying Facebook and Twitter, I don't know anything about that, but they, there are many, many, many different ways. You cannot forget about the public. Once you get them, which takes a lot of time and effort, if you let them go, you are stupid because it's the only way that you're going to get things done. Also, from a political standpoint, these groups that educate people and make them aware of the scale of things and the concerns and how things are connected, they didn't see the connection between the mill and the hydropower and the fish. And the They're going to pay attention to what the politicians say four years, five years, six years from now in a different way. They won't realize that it's not that simple. Jobs, environment. Either we have jobs or we look after the environment. People will start, not everybody, but you have a shift. And you see that in the newspaper, the local newspapers have a very good reflection. I can bet any money that if you look at the letters people write in the newspapers, I'm not sure if they do that here, but people write letters. And if you <coughs> take a sample of newspapers from the local community from the 90s and look at the, the, the letters and you tap them, make a tabulation of how many were about environmental issues, specifically the type of things we're talking about here, not wet, sa saving the whales, or there might be other things, but at a local level, how many people might have been concerned about restoration and the, 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 the value of restoration and the fish habitat and the water quality and the water temperature, you would have never, you, you wouldn't have seen anything. Now you pick up the newspaper and it's a completely different discussion. So, I mean, these, these are not <laughs> scientific evaluations, but you get a sense, I mean, John is the one who tells me all that and I live el elsewhere and I really don't have the time to be checking with, with all those groups, but he has uh, very, very, very good uh, indicators that the process works. And now we are, uh, we've been asked to, to basically try to expand it in Canada, in British Columbia, where I come from. Uh, I studied there for 20 years, so I have my connections. And, um, and the idea, again, is that these groups, and they are slightly different and similar in Canada. I mean, I think there is hope that with your local culture and history and politics, uh, still, the, the, the human uh, enterprise can be shaped in a way that adapts and functions and moves things forward in the, in the local environment. Uh, you can tweak with it. Uh, there might be many different ways you need to do it here versus Italy versus Sweden. But I think that the kernel, the center, the base, that from where you branch in different directions is likely to be the same. And again, involve the public, even if it's nothing else just to have support. Uh, if you think, well, I'm, they're not going to do the restoration, it's my group or the university. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. They're not going to do the restoration, although some people do. But uh, if the support is not there, when the money is allocated, for instance, from the lottery funds, if people wouldn't have started thinking about the, the fact that salmon habitat and rivers were being lost in Oregon, they wouldn't have voted to devote 20 or 40 million dollars a year to that. They would have asked for that for some other uh, uh, need. So I think it's very important. And here, like in Argentina, I perceive a lot of cynicism when it comes to the public participation <laughs> and, and the politicians' responses and how things are done. But again, I think that and I've seen it not in Argentina, uh, but in Chile, who has a different political culture. Don't ask me why, it may be the mountain effect. But there is less corruption and things work in a much more civilized way. Still South America, but it's a very different environment. Um, 
I've seen public participation with the Latin American flavor and we're still with some corruption and some inefficiency that has changed habitats and has basically stopped a dam from being built in southern Chile. That, that there was a process, a, a project to build the Aijen Dam right in front of Chiloé Island and uh, the public basically stopped it. And there was a lot of money and there were a lot of politicians that I'm sure would have been very happy to receive some compensation for their signature and that was stopped. But that was because people in that part, in the southern part of Chile, are very aware of the value of rivers to produce fish. And they weren't going to, even, these are exotic species, mind you, but uh, for the example I'm presenting is still valid. They didn't want those fish uh, populations to be affected and to go away uh, for the construction of a river dam. So uh, I, I still think that anything we do, unfortunately, if we keep doing it in the isolation of the university, or the research laboratory, a particular group, is really not going to change things that significantly in the future. Um, and I've seen some changes even in Mexico where a friend of mine works and there is a lot of corruption, believe me, uh, not less than Argentina. Uh, I admit that there is it's a big end endemic problem all over the continent, but the local communities and there are very strong native Indian communities that have certain rights and they are starting to learn. They've actually been working with US native tribes to try to force the government to do certain things that they need done. And the, um, water is a big issue, as you can imagine, is a very arid country except for the southern portion. And there is a lot of natural contamination with arsenic. So they have developed watershed councils in some form or shape that resembles the US. And there is a lot of active participation. Um, a friend of mine uh, is heavily involved with these groups providing them assessment. Actually, their, his wife, who's a lawyer, provides them information on how to organize themselves into non-government organizations and how to apply for funding both within, the, the, uh, within Mexico and from the US and Canada. I, last year I was at a conference that she organized to tell all these NGOs, most of them were environmental NGOs, although they were NGOs for uh, disabled people, NGOs for a whole spectrum of things, but the majority were environmental NGOs. It was a training session on how to apply for funding, and half the funding they were discussing was coming from the US, of private, private foundations, and how they could get money to do this or that in a river, how they could do this or that to provide a treatment plant to this little community for both drinking water and then gray water, that wastewater. So um, there is some hope, although the glaciers are, are melting very fast. So I think that we should stop here. Okay. Since ¿Qué pregunta? No, no, no. <risa> <risa> Una pregunta.